the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I leaves the ninety-nine. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God.
even when However you feel led this morning, if you would like to continue to stand or sit, your choice, as we continue to worship this morning.
Happy Mother's Day. If you've never met me before, my name is Elena Raskowski, and I'm the Youth and Family Director here at Christ Community. And for those online, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Um, it is Mother's Day, and as I look around, I see all these wonderful faces, these women that I've gotten to know and who have mothered me in many ways, who have um, been a sister to me in many ways. And so I thank you so much for um, doing that for me these past couple of years. I'd also like to think about my mom. She's not here, but she is the best, at least I think so. Um, but uh, this day is for all women, not just mothers, but those who have been nurturers, those who are um, grandmothers, aunts, godmothers, um, Whatever it may be, however you're nurturing in your life, we just thank you for your impact, um, and we want you to know that this day is also for you. As you came in this morning, you might have had a little challenge. You received a card if you're um, one of those nurturers that came in. Uh, hopefully, you took a few minutes to fill it out and tally up your points. There's a lot of funny ones on there that I was looking through, um, but all the women, you got a little treat but the top two that have the most tallies at the end get a little Mother's Day gift. So make sure you do that as you're sitting down today or afterwards, and we'll tally those up. I have a reading for you from Proverbs 8, verse 22 to 36. The Lord has possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs, abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. When he established the fountains of the deep. When he assigned the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of man. And now, sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors, for whoever finds me life and obtains favor from the Lord, but he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. So a few announcements for you guys today. Family Promise is coming up. That is the ministry that we do with uh, St. John. Family Promise is its own, um, its own foundation, but St. John is um, a host church out in Hazeldell. They take on uh, homeless families that are on the brink of homelessness that especially have children. We want to make sure that in the between time, they're able to um, have a resource, get back up on their feet, um, and just have a loving place to be. They also have resources resources in the daytime, um, able to look at you know different job listings. The kids get tutoring. It's a really great uh, it's a really great opportunity for us to be a support church to St. John. And what a support church is is uh, we provide meals each day, um, a dinner meal. They ha they have meals in uh, breakfast each day, and they have meals at um, lunch that they can take, but we provide a dinner one night per those weeks. So we also have evening hosts. I think the, our meal is covered, which is awesome, and we do have evening hosts. I think we could take one more evening host. All it is is you're just there to be a resource, um, answer questions if they have it, but usually you're just you're just a friendly face to know that they're, they're not alone and they have somebody there waiting for them. Um, God on Tap is this week, May 11th uh, at 6.30 to 8. That's at Ridgefield Craft Brewing. And it's just a time where we get together and talk about whatever is on your mind. Eli, I always say that you can stump the pastor. If you have a burning question that you've had um, about the Bible or even just things going on in our world, we just want to sit down, have beer, and talk together. So invite anyone um, that, that likes beer and just wants to sit and talk. Uh, the last thing is we do have a cookie sign up um, to bring cookies uh, as we have each week out with our coffee. So if you're a good baker, share your recipes. We want to we wanna taste those uh, baked goods. At this time, I'd like to announce our offering. Um, our offering goes to the ministries here at Christ Community. And out of God's rich blessings, we want to give those back out to him in the ways that we serve our community and our church family.
The ways that you can do that are up on the screen. We have our red offering boxes at the welcome table and also right here on your way out. We have our um, ccridgefield.com. We have a giving tab there as well as our app. And the last is mailing at our PO box in Ridgefield. Uh, but at this time, I'd like to start us off with a prayer as we go to the rest of our service. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your presence. I know that you're here. You're always here with us. Where two or three are gathered, you are in our midst. But we invite you today. Um, and we're just reminded of all the blessings that we have of the women in our life that have put an impact, um, who have loved us, who have nurtured us, Lord. Um, and we just pray, um, I pray for myself and for the other women that you would continue to put those gifts in us so that we can pour out as you've created us. Um, God, I just pray for all the things on our hearts, Lord, the things that we go day in and day out, maybe unspoken, maybe there's something weighing on us. And so I just pray that you would calm our hearts this morning, um, that you would bring support around us, uh, the places that we need support, and just space to breathe. You are a God of abundance, and you, you are a God of rest. Help us to remember that. God, we pray over um, healing. We pray for Ryan and Amara, especially this morning as they're out. We pray um, that they just heal soon and that they recover quickly from being sick. And we also pray for those with um, upcoming surgeries. We pray for uh, Paul White as he has an upcoming surgery and for hearing, hearing loss. We also pray for uh, Greg Hendricks as he heals from following knee surgery. We also pray over Vicki Epperson and her healing. God, in all ways, we just thank you. You're a good God. Still us and help us to worship you with our full hearts today. In your name we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. If I haven't met you yet this morning, I'm Eli. I'm the pastor of Christ Community. I am really glad to have you worshiping with us today as we are celebrating this morning, as we are celebrating mothers today. Uh, Thank you for all that you do. How many of you have had a mother? (laughs) For those of you with your hands down, you're getting it wrong. (laughs) One way or another, we have had mothers. Some of them have been great. Maybe you had a mother who wasn't so great. But we recognize that God has given this very important role to people in our lives. Maybe the mother you had wasn't the mother you were born to, but it was someone else. Maybe it was an aunt who cared for you, a grandmother. Maybe it was a mother in foster care. But it's a high calling. In fact, the Bible is full of references to the importance of Of mothers. And so for the mothers in the room, for the aunts in the room, for those who, as Elena said, have taken the time to nurture others, I want to thank you this morning for that. We are continuing talking about this series that we've been doing in the wake of Easter, the wake of Good Friday and Easter. We've been talking about reverse the curse. What led to the need for Good Friday and Easter? What led to the need for Jesus? And as we are in our third week on this, um, I got to thinking, there's been a lot of rain this week. Uh, In fact, I don't know if you noticed, it hailed like crazy yesterday. And I got a little concerned uh, because I have vegetable starts out in my garden and I was hoping that they were going to survive it. How many of you are gardeners? Okay. All right. Now, let me clarify for those of you who put your hands up. I'm talking about people who actually cultivate their yard. Not like, hey, I planted flowers out front and hope that they grew. Yeah, but actually really get into it. Anybody like that? Any of you like that? Yeah. Okay, there were fewer hands that time. I I wasn't really raising my hand. It was an example because I will confess that gardening is not my thing. I'm a guy who likes to dig a hole and stick something in it and hope that it survives. Right? My garden right now is in great shape because my parents came down and cleaned it out. That's my mother's gift, not mine. Uh, Part of me thinks it's because of all the Saturdays I lost having to work out in the yard as a kid. Maybe that's why. Um, I really like the idea of a garden producing things that I like to eat, but I hate the execution. (sighs) When it comes to gardening, though, what is the biggest challenge? What's the biggest challenge that you face in your garden? Weeds, right? This is the thing. This, this gives us trouble. Pests, you know, bugs, slugs, and weeds. I think weeds are the biggest enemy of the gardener because no matter what you do, they keep coming back. You realize dandelions are the only thing that grow in the summer? My grass can be completely brown. 
No sign of love. I haven't had to mow my grass for two months. But I have these green spots in it because the dandelion somehow managed to survive. Or in the vegetable garden when you're cleaning it out and you grab the weeds, those ones that have the pop seeds in it that fly everywhere. Right? You look at them cross-eyed and they spread their seed all over the place. I can ignore my vegetables. The plants rapidly wither and die. But dandelions and weeds survive everything we can throw at them. And I think this battle, the invasiveness and the endurance of certain plants, the constant struggle to produce food and flowers, all of this is what God is talking about in Genesis chapter 3 when he responds to the actions of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Two weeks ago when we began the series, uh, we started this calling this reverse the curse. And what we're talking about is, is this whole Good Friday and Easter thing. It's good to know that faith in Jesus means that we're saved. We're saved from our punishment. We're saved from our sins. We're saved from eternal separation from God. We're saved from hopelessness about our future. We're saved from feeling meaningless in our present. We're saved from ourselves by Jesus. And yet, we still live in a world that groans underneath the weight of a curse. And we have to ask the question, how did we get to this place? And it's really easy to say, well, because of sin. But what was the cause? Where did it all begin? We live in a world where sin is a subjective thing. Followers of Jesus set their morality against the Bible. God gives us standards for life, how to live, how to relate to one another. But for those who don't believe in Jesus, the sense of morality, the sense of fairness, or right and wrong can very easily be quite a bit different. Have you ever had those conversations? You have talked to someone and you're coming from a place of faith and they're coming from a place that's not and you do not meet in the middle. Sin is the core of the troubles that we experience. But the individual actions, you know, what we call or we don't call sin, is really not what it's all about. And I'm not diminishing sins, I'm not diminishing actions, but what we discover from Genesis chapter 3 is that the heart of sin, the key, is our rejection of God. At the heart of all sin comes this place where we choose to go our own way or do our own thing or look after our own priorities or our own desires. It's a rejection of the goodness that God has for us. It's a rejection of the lives that we were built to live. Sin is the choice to prioritize ourselves and our pleasures over the will of the one who created us in the first place. And this is what we discover when we read Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, the first people that God created... They made that first choice to go against God's directions and all of the brokenness, all of the pain and suffering, all of the conflict and the shame and the hurt and the anger and the greed and the selfishness and the battles with identity and the pain of disease and the damage we do to our families, the wars that we fight, the poverty that we experience, the famine that devastates our communities. All of this comes from the choice to turn against God. We have a choice. We do. And so often that choice is to eat from the tree. To eat the fruit of death rather than surrender our will to the will of God. Sin is all about saying, I know better than he does. When we do that, we embrace death. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, he says, For the wages of sin is death. This is the logical progression. This is what we get for our actions. The result of sin is death, and that is why we need a curse reverser. Because death is a mark of the curse. And the curse is in place because of sin. And sin comes from a rejection of God. We need that curse reverser because we choose death. And Jesus is the one God sent to do this for us. 
He came to create, to, uh, he came to create beauty out of desolation. He came to bring hope out of hopelessness, to replace fear with faith and make light in the midst of darkness. He came to dispel the death. Maybe it'll help if we look at it this way. In the Bible, death means separation. We tend to think about death in a very practical standpoint, the end of our physical lives. But in reality, what death really is, is it's it's far more encompassing. It's a lot bigger than the end of mortal life because death is the separation of two things. Francis Schaeffer is a mid-20th century pastor and theologian, uh, and he identifies separation in this way. He points out five areas uh, of separation that come from the curse of sin, and I want to take just a couple of quick moments to touch on these real quick. And the first one is this, one area of death, it's it's psychological separation. Psychological separation is us being separated from ourselves. We're not the people that God created us to be. When sin came into the world, Adam and Eve experienced this psychological separation that they had never experienced before. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 7 it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened. This was right after they ate from the tree. The eyes of them were open. They realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. They were suddenly naked and ashamed. When sin entered the world, so did insecurity. When sin entered the world, so did anxiety. Do you ever doubt who you are? Do you ever struggle with feeling good enough or worthy enough or lovable enough? All of this is psychological separation. We were never meant to feel these things. We were never meant to experience them. We were built complete, but what sin did is it broke it all apart. The second area of separation is spiritual separation. Sin separates us from God. In week one, we saw that when their eyes were open, when they discovered evil, they hid from God. They went to that tree, and that tree was a choice. I mentioned this last week. I said, I I, I do not believe that there was any magic inherent in the fruit itself. It wasn't like eating the fruit suddenly imparted knowledge the way that reading a book or maybe some sort of, I don't know if you ever tried to sleep on a book when you were in college or high school and hoped that you could absorb the content, right? Yeah, through osmosis. I don't think there was actually anything magic in the fruit. I think the tree was the choice. God said, don't eat from this tree. And he set it up there for us to decide whether we were going to love God or love ourselves. And the minute they ate from the tree, that's what made the change. When they ate, quite simply, they suddenly discovered evil. They learned what it means to defy God and they hide. They're afraid because they know that they have chosen ambition over perfection. I think a lot of us feel this, probably more often than we'd like. We know the choices we make. We know the actions we take of all the things that we fail to do, and we feel guilty. We feel bad. We can't bring ourselves to face God. Maybe some of you feel this way all the time. You wonder how God could ever love you because of your life choices. You're stuck on spiritual separation. We'll go into this more in a minute, but let me tell you, if this is you, don't give up because the curse reverser came for you. It may feel like God has drawn away, but we're the ones drawing away. We're the ones who are out hiding from God, and in your sin, he is reaching out to you. Paul sums this up really well in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, but God proves his love for us. I love how that's put. He proves his love for us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While you were still hiding amongst the trees, Jesus came and he died for you. While you were still cowering in the brush, covered with fig leaves, hoping to obscure your shame and your nakedness, Jesus came to reverse the curse. This is God's proof of his love for you. He didn't wait for us to sort it out. He's reversing the curse of spiritual separation right now. He is in the garden, you're hiding, and he's calling. The third area is social separation. Sin separates us from each other. I think we see this a lot. Our relationships are broken. There is brokenness in our relationships together. God meant for us to exist together. He meant for us to support one another. In Genesis, after he created man, he looks through all the rest of his creation 
and he couldn't find a helper who was suitable, so he created woman out of man. Why? Because of all the creation, this was the only part which he fashioned with the care of his own hands. This is the only part of creation that received his spirit to bring life. He created Eve to be the perfect companion, sharing God's spirit and making them a unit put together. But when sin enters, what do they do? They turn on each other. Right? When God confronts Adam, Adam turns around and he blames Eve for the fruit. There's brokenness in relationship. They're ashamed and naked in each other's presence. The curse drives a wedge into our families. We see this all the time. Strife between spouses. Brokenness in marriages. Anger between brothers and sisters or between parents and children. Sin comes on the scene and it brings with it discord and divorce and jealousy and accusation. It brings things like racism and hate. None of this was what God intended. Any of you have someone that you just can't stand to be around? Don't raise your hand. Just think on it. You have someone that you can't stand to bring or be around? I don't say hate because I really try not to hate anyone. Hating is too much of a burden for us to bear. But there are people that I just can't stand to be near. And this is the curse. It's social separation. The fourth one is physical separation. Sin separates the body from the soul. Physical death. The minute sin entered the world, Adam and Eve began to die. They began to experience pain and disease. God warned them that if they ate from the tree, they would know death. And guess what? They gained wisdom. They gained wisdom, but the wisdom came from the heart of school. It came at a great cost. They discovered firsthand what death was like. Physical separation separates the body and the soul, which were meant to be one. The last one is environmental separation. From the moment sin entered the world, the world fell out of sync. This is not the world that God intended for us to inhabit. And this is where we're at today. Last week, we looked at the curse of Eve, the pain in childbirth, a desire for control, but, subject, uh, but subjection to a patriarchal system. That was God's curse. This week, it's all about thorns and thistles. If you have your Bibles this morning, you want to open those up, Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses seven, uh, 17 and 18. You can pop open the Christ Community Church app, grab the Bible in there at the bottom of the page. But here's what happened. Once the truth about the tree came out, God first dealt with the tempter. Right? He dealt with the serpent who had deceived Eve. Then he dealt with Eve who took the first sinful step. But then he turns to Adam. To Adam, the one that he had spoken the direction to in the first place. The one who had heard directly from God what was supposed to happen. Adam, who had first walked in the garden with the Lord. Adam, who had received his purpose directly from God, his purpose to tend the garden and to care for it, to live in harmony with all that God had made, to enjoy his presence. Adam is the third one to which God speaks. And in verse 17, it says, And, Ad- and to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of Of your wife. Now, I want to pause for a moment. God is not saying, husbands, do not listen to your wives. That's not what this means. God isn't saying, look, husbands, if you want to avoid sin, don't listen to your wives. That's not that's not what it says. I mean, I know it sounds like what it says, but this is not freedom. What this says is there's only Adam and Eve and the serpent and God. And what God is saying to Adam is because you listened to someone other than me, when it came to what you should do, look back at what Adam did. Eve took from the tree. Adam was right there with her. He didn't speak up. She handed him the fruit. He ate from the fruit. Okay? It could have been George the janitor. But in this case, it was Eve. In which case, God would have said, don't listen to George. But in this case, it was Eve. Because you listened to the voice of your wife rather than the voice of God. And have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your lives. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth. There's that word, thorns and thistles. It shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. Now I asked you about gardening at the beginning because of this verse. 
The bane of every gardener is in this passage. The ground is cursed. Sin brought thorns and thistles, which spring up to confound our efforts to choke out the fruit of our labors. We live in a fallen world, and we are nowhere close to having enough weed killer. So here you are, gardening your way through life. Everything sprouts up nicely. You have some savings in the bank. You have money in your retirement. You have a plan for the future, and everything looks good. And suddenly the skies open, and the hail comes, and your plans are destroyed. You get sick. You can't work, or a pipe bursts and floods your house, or the doctor tells you the cancer is terminal, or whatever the news is that devastates your world. And it's in these moments that we are reminded that we live in a world of thorns and thistles. In 2008, the market plunged and businesses contracted, and people were laid off. Suddenly, people with good jobs and educations, people who'd spent their life building their empire, were unemployed. The savings ran out, the house was repossessed, their spouse left. They have nothing but the shirt on their back and maybe some belongings stuffed into a car. That's thorns and thistles. 2020, we started hearing about the little virus and it didn't seem like such a big deal. There were a few cases, nothing to worry about, a couple of deaths. More people died from lightning strikes than COVID at that time. But then it grew and schools closed and restaurants shut their doors and people lost their jobs and then people started getting sick. A lot of people. And families were devastated by the loss of loved ones and people came down sick with long COVID and couldn't work for months at a time or care for their families and continue to exist. Some of them continue in some weird sort of half-life. I have one guy I know, he has not been able to taste anything for a year. For a year. For a year, he's unable to go up a flight of stairs because he gets winded. We lost our ability to gather and be social. For two years, everything seemed pretty dark. This was thorns and thistles. In this moment, we know the world is more hostile and we are more fragile than we would ever want to imagine. I was thinking about this and I was thinking about that first summer in 2020 because that was when the stay-at-home orders were in place and all this stuff. I remember canceling plans. I remember those opportunities just to go outside. And it felt like such a relief. Jennifer and I would take walks around Ridgefield. It was great just to be outdoors. You started appreciating the fact that you could actually go out for exercise. I started appreciating exercise. You know, we were out in the open air. There was plenty of circulation, plenty of space to distance. We, transmission was assumed to be lower. It just felt like freedom. We went camping a bunch that summer just to do something that allowed us to recreate. I remember one day going up to Multnomah Falls, and we hiked the trail up to the falls. How many of you have been up there? Okay. Looks a little something. I got a picture here, Elena, I think. Yeah. So we walked up to the bridge, took the path up, and the path getting up to the bridge is paved, and it's fairly wide. And as we went up the path, this lady's coming down, and We weren't wearing masks because, quite frankly, I had it with me, but walking and breathing hard, really, it sucked to to do that. And we're coming down the path, and she sees us, and she stops. And we stop. And she won't go past. And so we start to edge up, and she kind of blocks the path. And she wouldn't let us go, and she wouldn't pass us until we put our masks on. Even though we were on this huge path, and there were like six feet of space between us, and we could have edged along the edge. Now, I'm not trying to be negative about her. I wore a lot of masks over the last couple of years, even at times when maybe I didn't need to, because quite frankly, I'm a rule follower. That's just what I do. And I was okay with the precautions. But thinking back on this lady, what I realized is that thorns and thistles are all around us, right? There are so many things that make us afraid. There are so many things that wear on our emotions and endurance, And fear may exist to help us avoid danger, but danger exists because we live in a fallen world. We can't escape the thorns. There isn't enough money to put in our bank accounts. There aren't enough masks and bottles of sanitizer. We can't eat healthy enough to avoid the thorns and the thistles in our life. But fortunately for us, Jesus didn't avoid them either. Jesus knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to be alone, to be cold or thirsty or hungry. He knows what it's like to be hurt or sick. He knows what it's like to be abandoned and friendless. He knows what it's like to be afraid. In fact, just before Jesus is arrested, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying in Luke chapter 22. 
And it says he prayed with such earnest passion in the agony of his emotions, in his fear, that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And in John 19, verse 2, after Jesus is arrested and he's taken before Pilate, he gets the thorns in a very physical way. In verse 2, it says, the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? The crown of thorns is pressed into his head, and with those thorns, he's taking the pain of our punishment. He's taking our sins on his shoulders. He's reversing the curse so one day we can be with him in paradise the way that it was intended to be. I know we wonder at times why, if Jesus took the thorns for us, we still have hurt. Why do we still battle the thorns and the thistles if Jesus went to the cross? The fact is, Jesus died for us, but we still live in a world that's under the curse. What Jesus did for us wasn't free us from the suffering of this life. What he did was free us from death. He freed us from the separation between us and God. In John chapter 16, Jesus makes a statement that really puts this all together, I think. He says to his disciples, he says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And what he says is that despite everything we do, thorns and thistles are going to pop up in everything that we attempt. Your life, my life, invasive weeds are just a fact of life. They're going to be there. But in this passage in John, Jesus makes a promise. He's telling the disciples that he is going to die. That's what this passage, this section, is about. He's telling them that he is going to die. That they're going to experience loss because of his death. That they will mourn and experience sadness. The thorns and the thistles of the world are going to overwhelm them. But he promises them that in their grief, hope comes. That it will turn to joy. That what they experience will only be for a time because the time of trouble will not last forever. And this is the promise that Jesus is making for us as well. This is why he's the curse reverser. The time we spend on this earth, I know it seems so big and so significant now, but up against eternity, it's such a small period of time. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know what thorns and thistles are threatening to overwhelm your garden. Your life may be filled with trouble. But look at how Jesus started that verse. All of the things about sorrow and pain that he shares with the disciples, he says to them, I tell you this so that you may have peace. He's telling them they're going to have sorrow. They're going to lose Jesus. It won't stop there. They're going to live lives of hardship and pain and and, and suffering. Every apostle except for one died for his faith. Not talk about thorns and thistles. But Jesus says it won't last forever. He says, take peace even in the midst of sorrow because I have already taken care of the curse. The effects will continue to plague us, but it's not going to last forever. It may seem like a lot right now, but you are not alone. You're not overwhelmed. Jesus has already reversed the curse. He's already won the victory for you so that sin and death and pain and suffering and brokenness and despair won't have the final word. I'll leave you with one final thought. And it's this. Not only has Jesus won victory over death for you on the cross, not only has he paid the price for the entire world, He's also given you the strength that you need to endure the struggles of thorns and thistles. When you take his burden and you give him your burden, nothing this world throws at you is impossible. Paul makes a statement in Romans chapter 5. He says, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Have you been rejoicing in your sufferings? How many of you say, hey, yeah, man, this was a tough week. Hallelujah. Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing a hallelujah. I'm going to do it. I'm, life is going lousy and I'm rejoicing. 
But that's what Paul says. More than that, we rejoice in our suffering. Know that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. How many of you have ever celebrated the development of character? My parents would tell me that character was what I got when I suffered. I would complain. My parents say that builds character. Didn't celebrate the building of character, but here's Paul saying, rejoice in it. And what he's saying is the way that you face your thorns and thistles have the power to produce hope in others. How about that? That perseverance and character and hope, maybe that's not just for us. I read an article a while back that was written to oppose death with dignity, physician-assisted suicide, and the argument they made was this. How we go to our death, as people of faith, how we go to our death, especially in the face of overwhelming pain and humiliation, gives testimony to the hope that we have in God. How we die testifies to the faith that we have. But what if it isn't just how we die? What if how we live gives testimony to the hope and the faith that we have? What if perseverance in the faith of, face of overwhelming odds give hope to those who are about to be overwhelmed? I think this is what Paul's saying. I think this is the hope that God is alluding to, even as he speaks the curse for sin on Adam. He says, you're going to have thorns and thistles in your life. The world is broken and trouble is what it produces, but you also have one who has redeemed your story and broken the curse of sin that held you captive. He gives you the strength to face your troubles. And when you step up to the challenge, Jesus is proclaimed and God is glorified. Think on that for a minute. How you face the troubles of your life gives testimony to the presence of Jesus in your life. Who knew that your pain could do great works for the kingdom of God? So when the thorns and thistles come, and when life feels overwhelming, take comfort in knowing that there is one who has suffered and died for you, who has taken the burden of your pains on his shoulders, and who has already given you victory over the grave. And it's in his name that we celebrate this morning. Amen? We're going to do here in just a minute, I'm going to invite David up and the team up. And I believe our final song this morning is No Longer Slaves. How convenient. We're talking about no longer slaves because that's a reverse the curse song this morning. So I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to share the blessing. And then we are going to sing no longer slaves this morning. And what I would encourage you to do is mean it. As you sing it, remember that you are no longer a slave to sin. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.
I'm no 